How cool is that? Our tech team actually went back in history and got some photos of Jesus. So that's really cool. Hey, I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to you guys because you make this the best place to be in the world on Sunday morning. Uh, whether you've been here a hundred times or you haven't been here for several weeks and you just pop back in, uh, we try to make this feel like a family. And it's you guys that do that. When you look over and say, "Hey, here's someone sitting beside me," I don't know. You reach over and you shake a hand, or you give them a high five, or you look up and here's someone all by themselves, and just that casual greeting. You know, you're not throwing yourself into someone and saying, hey, I have to intimidate you and know everything about you, but rather just, just this warm, friendly atmosphere that you guys keep making happen around here. And it's a lot of fun. We keep having to set up more and more rows of chairs, uh, which say that you're excited, you're inviting your friends, and we're just watching God change lives. And so that is a lot of fun. It is a blast, by the way, to see all the information and questions that you send back to us on Twitter and Facebook. The uh, hashtag, by the way, for the whole sermon series is uh, hashtag last week 15. I got a little echo, guys. If you can clean that up for me, that'd be great. And so it's a lot of fun just to interact with you, and uh, we're looking forward to doing some more stuff like that in the future. But uh, if you're online today, uh, feel free to go ahead and tweet us and uh, participate with the service. We're glad you're joining us as well. Uh, so, uh, you ever seen a spelling bee? Did you ever participate in one of those when you were in school? Like, you, you went and did the whole spelling bee, and you got all these words, you don't know what they are, and they're telling you to spell it. I, I had a kind of a motto. When I was in, in fourth grade, is the first spelling bee I remember, and the seventh grade was the last one that I remember. But I had a motto of I was going to join in every contest for the spelling bee they had, because in our family, Losing wasn't terrible. I mean, we, no one likes to lose, but, but not participating was worse than losing. And so I can't spell at all. Literally, I tried to spell at all the other day, and it was just at, at all, and it didn't work right. And so, uh, but, but I joined every one of them, and every one of them, you stand up, and you, you begin the conversation, and they, they give you this word, right? And then you go, oh, shoot, I don't know how to spell that, but uh, maybe I'll get some help. And so you ask, can I please have the definition, right? And if you were like me and you couldn't spell anyways, you wanted to soak up every bit of time you had on the stage for a moment because you knew you weren't going to get any more after you spelled whatever word it was, right? And so you said, may I please have the definition? And then they would give you the definition and it didn't help at all, did it? You're like, man, I'm even more confused. Root has uh, uh, Spanish in it. Now I'm lost, right? And, 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 but the definition is supposed to describe the word. It's supposed to define and tell you what the word is so that now you know what it is, you can, you can now spell it. Yeah. The definition describes what that word is or does. And so I started thinking, when I was looking at, at this passage here in Mark 4, if you've got your Evice, you want to join us in that, Mark 4, I started thinking about, well, what if, what if we had like a people spelling contest or something? Like a, and, and so each one of us had a terrible opportunity, because this wouldn't be fun at all, though. But, but we had an opportunity, we came up and we stood right here, and they said, all right, define yourself. Would that be intimidating? Holy cow, right? Define yourself. The, the question, though, is a great question because what, what a few words would you use? Because you can't give, like, a, you know, well, back when I was two, this happened. Back when I was three, you know, you only get a couple words to describe yourself. So if that was the case right now, I said to you, you got to turn to your neighbor right now. Give them seven words to describe yourself. Let's go ahead and do it. Ready? Seven words. Find someone that doesn't look too scary. Some of you may have to move. All right? Find someone that doesn't look too scary. Just give them a couple words. Say, if I had to define myself with a couple words, not sentences, not phrases, this is, this is how I would define myself. So you may have to turn around, look around, make sure no one's left out here. Okay, ready? Go. That's hard, isn't it? But you know why? Because uh, one, we don't want to feel like we're bragging and saying all the good stuff. But two, we don't want to be like, hey, I'm just going to dump out my broken heart on you and like bleed all over you right here in church, even though this is the appropriate place to do that, by the way. But, but it's hard to define ourselves, right? 
And yet every day we walk around and we are given definitions or labels and sometimes we accept those and sometimes we reject them. There are negative ones that maybe you've dealt with or maybe you are dealing with, right? Like the band nerd, the jock, stupid, ugly, the fat kid. We've gone so far in Fairborn, we even put up signs, slow kids playing. I always drive by those houses and think, poor kids. They'll never be as fast as the other kids. And, and then there are, there, are, there are ones that like really cut to the core. Like ones that people say, and you know, they're no longer just being mean, they're being hateful. And they, they, they call you slut. And then we go into words that we probably should never say, right? And then there are words that, that define us that we never really wanted. Negative phrases that that became us, that we, we never wanted, we never intended to get. We just, it just happened in the midst of painful situations in life. And, 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 and hear me say, I don't think you should be defined by any of those or any of these, but, but, but we carry them around. So we're going to claim them for just a second, and it's going to be a little painful for a second. So just hang on a second. But we're like, I'm divorced, right? Nobody ever got married saying, I want to be divorced later. And yet some of us walk around and, and, and though no one else in this room looks at you like that, you feel like you walk around with like the scarlet letter on you. And for some of us, we come out of broken families where I once, once had the, the definition of mother, but I no longer have that. For whatever painful reason that is. And some of us have widow and widower as our definition. We, we live with those painful definitions of who we are. Of course, there are positive definitions as well, right? And when we raise our children and grandchildren, these are what we try to pass on, right? These positive definitions, we, we call them beautiful, right? We say, hey, cutie. And, and, and we say, you know, you're handsome, you're, you're honorable, you're, you have valor. You, know, we, you use these words to describe, and we try to implant them in our kids' heads. Every night before my kids go to bed, I remind them that they're beautiful and sacred because God made them that way. Because God made you that way. Nobody can take that away from you. Because God made you beautiful and sacred. Nobody can snatch that from you. Because God created you and it's so deep within you. It's in the very fibers of your DNA. That no one can take away your sacredness or beauty that God put in you. We spend a lot of time as parents and, and, and grandparents. And even thinking about ourselves. Trying to, trying to raise up self-esteem, right? Right? And we come home and our kids, somebody called me stupid, and they're crying. You're like, oh, and you're thinking this kid's never going to recover from self-esteem. And you go back to third grade too, and you hate so-and-so all over again. And, and you're sitting there wiping their tears away. But my suggestion would be we stop worrying about self-esteem so much, and we start worrying about self-worth. Because our self-esteem is wrapped up in what do we think about ourselves. And in the passage we're going to look at today, that maybe what we think about ourselves isn't as important as what... God thinks about us, which is where we tie in our self-worth. You see, I have value not because you said so, not because I'm married so-and-so, not because I'm dating so-and-so, not because I, I brought this per purse or I own this phone or because I wore these types of jeans or I live in this place. I have value because of who my God is. And you can't take that away. Na -na 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 -na. Right? My God made me beautiful and sacred. So we're going to look here. It's Wednesday according to the last week of Christ. On Sunday, Jesus comes in, and that's, we celebrate Palm Sunday, and we got the palm branches and, and Jesus on the donkey. Monday, we talked about Jesus cleaning the temple, uh, and he talked about it being a den of robbers. On Tuesday, Megan taught us about uh, how the authorities were trying to trap Jesus, and Jesus giving the greatest commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And now we're on Wednesday, all right? Hump day! I just can't resist some of those. Eh? All right, so it's Wednesday, and Mark 14 starts out like this. It was, it was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, not during the festival or there may be a riot among the people. So the, 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 the political leaders at the time are so upset of Jesus, by Jesus, that they're looking for a way now to arrest and kill him. 
Jesus has so upset the power systems that go on in the world that, that, that the people who have power are absolutely so furious that they're now looking for a way, not, not to like just get Jesus out of it, they're looking for a way to kill him. Now this is huge because Jesus comes and he introduces, he introduces a new system, a kingdom system that is different from anything we know. And a kingdom system that still challenges everything today because there are religions that are still around today that are about dominating and overpowering and conquering and killing everybody who doesn't believe what we believe, right? But Jesus says, that's, that's not how we do it. That's not how God, God gave you free will. He has given you freedom and, and he loves you whether you love him back or not. And so I introduce a system of service. I introduce a religion that says, I'm not here to force you to love me, but I'm here to woo you to me. Because, baby, you've lost that love and feeling. And it's gone. Gone. Whoa, whoa. Right? Everybody that's like 30 and under is going, what is he talking about? All right? And, and, and Jesus says, look, we have a new kingdom system that says, look, I'm not here to conquer you. I'm here to convince you about how awesome our God is. In fact, I'm here to save you. And I'm going to do that by dying for you. And everybody goes, what? Jesus says, it's a new system. It's a system of sacrifice and love that will conquer everything in the end. And this new kingdom system that Jesus introduces, all right, changes everything. It changes everything. It, it says to bullies, it says to people that are trying to harm you, it says to, to people that, that abuse people, it says, look, you never get what you really want that way. You don't really love someone when you behave that way. He, what would happen if you sacrificed for someone. And so Jesus introduces a new system and a new way of thinking. It's huge. It's huge. Mark 14. Now we finally get to the story here with this lady. You ready? Jesus was at Bethany, a guest of Simon the leper. We are assuming that Simon the leper is no longer a leper, but that was his name because Jesus healed him. While he was eating dinner, a woman came up carrying a bottle of very expensive perfume. Opening the bottle, she poured it on his head. Did you catch her name? Thank you. That was a long wait there for now. Yeah, she didn't get a name. In fact, she goes this whole story without getting a name. Now, again, we're going to talk about identity and what defines us. It is absolutely fascinating. That in this story, that, that, that in just a moment, Mark's going to say this will be told forever. Wherever the gospel is proclaimed, this story is going to be told. That this woman doesn't even get a name. But yet she is honored above everybody else. In just a moment we'll see that. In just a moment we'll see that. So she, she comes in, and, and you, gotta, you can't miss the beauty of what's going on. Jesus is sitting here at the table, and this woman kind of interrupts the meal. And she comes behind him, and she's got this bottle of, of perfume, and they, it's, it's called nard, and it's made out of these roots and stuff, and I'm going to assume it smells good. I've never smelled nard, nor does it sound like something I really want on me. But, uh, so she's pouring that on Jesus' head, and you see it kind of just bathe his entire head, and it's dripping off his head. And, and, and what she's doing is just absolutely beautiful. Don't miss that here's this woman who has found this moment to be so important that she's going to interrupt the meal to anoint Jesus' head, that she is at this moment holding the source of all life in her hands as she pours this on his head. Don't miss this beautiful, I love you so much, Jesus, moment. That the only gift that I have of value I am giving you, and it's this bottle of perfume, and I am anointing you with this perfume. Now, to understand what's really going on, we have to take a commercial break. Yeah, same back channel, same back time in just a second, okay? Because there's an interruption now. All right, we have this beautiful moment going on, and, and, but, but everybody else missed it. Just Jesus and this woman, the unnamed woman, get it. Everybody else misses it. This is what it says, Mark 14, verse 4. Some of the guests became furious amongst themselves. Like furious, angry, like, oh, I just get so mad. I turn green and start ripping things up. They said, that's criminal, a sheer waste. This perfume could have been sold for over a year's wages. Shows you how much this lady valued this. Those wages could have been handed out to the poor. They swelled up in anger. <laughs> right? You ever seen anybody swell up in anger? It's not pretty, is it? Nearly bursting with indignation over her. A year's wages. 
Man, can you imagine buying something that's a perfume for like a year's wages? That stuff better like just, I better beat my wife off of me if it's going to cost me that much, right? Like, no, dear, get away. I got to stop using this stuff all the time, right? A year's wages. So the disciples kind of have a right mindset. They're like, what, what is she doing? I know how much she just dumped on Jesus. I mean, that's a year's wages. You ever miss what's going on? Like what's really going on? You ever been at the dinner table and, and like you realized you didn't have a clue what's going on? Like even though the conversation was going on? Like, like I feel this way a lot with my jokes in here. Like maybe we're just missing it, okay? I tell jokes and there's not the appropriate response of laughter. But. So I took my kids uh, several years ago. I was on a, a trip and I got back and Allie was like, thank you, Jesus. And she like just left. I think she just went on a vacation. I think she said something about I've been in jail with these kids for too long. I'm out of here. And I wanted to do something special with them. And so we went to like, a, it, was, it wasn't Chuck E. Cheese, but it had a big indoor playground area and it had the games and the tokens and the tickets. And I thought, you know, this will be a really great dad moment. I want to play with them. I want to hang out with my kids. I want to do this together. And so we all went to this place and, and we got the pizza. And, and, and in just a m- couple more minutes, we started to what? Fight over who had the most coins. And then we fought over who had the most tickets. And then we were upset that we didn't have enough tickets to buy the jumbo two-cent toy, right? And, and, and then we got in the car, and we were all tired and grouchy, and, 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 I, and I'm sitting there driving away going, I wanted to say I love you. I wanted my kids to go, wow, what a great moment we had with Dad, and I'm glad Dad's back. And, and we, we just missed it all and all that we were doing. We just missed the point of the moment. That's, that's what's going on with the disciples and everybody around. They, they missed the moment. They missed the moment. Mark 14, 6, Jesus said, let her alone. Just, just let, her, let her alone. Will you believe her be. What's wrong with you guys? Why are you giving her a hard time? She's done something wonderfully significant for me. You will always have the poor with you every day for the rest of your lives. Whenever you feel like it, you can do something for them. Not so with me. She did what she could when she could. She pre-anointed my body for burial. And you can be sure. Now listen to this. That wherever in the whole world the message is preached, what she just did is going to be talked about admiringly. Wow. Now don't miss it. Don't miss this. You see in the passage it says, she did what she could when she could. It disappeared on us. It's not coming back either. There we go. She did what she could when she could. So there's a reason why this woman interrupts the, the, the meal. She, she sits there in her head going, look, I hear Jesus saying, I'm going to die. I'm going to be resurrected. And, and it's going to be coming very soon. It's going to be very soon. It's going to be very soon. The disciples have missed this. In fact, in Mark, there are three specific moments where Jesus has said to his disciples, I'm going to go to the cross and die. You won't see me again, but I'm dying for you. And it's going to be better for you that I die. And I'm going to die for your sins as a ransom. And the disciples are like, we don't get it. And believe me, I don't throw stones at the disciples because I don't think I would have got it either. But Jesus is saying, I'm going away. I'm going to die. And the disciples are like, look, look Jesus, you're not going to die. Okay, we're going to talk you out of this. You don't know what you're talking about. But here is the woman. In the midst of this final week of Jesus, on this Wednesday, she has heard Jesus' message, and she believes, and she responds appropriately, saying, I don't know when I'm going to get to anoint you. I don't know if I'm going to ever be there to be at your burial. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. But I've heard you say this is coming and coming soon, and so I'm going to do what I can when I can. And so she interrupts the meal saying, I don't know if I ever get a chance to do this again, Jesus. And so I'm going to live for the moment right now, and I'm going to anoint you for your burial now. She has heard this. Listen, 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 listen. She has heard the message of Jesus and responded appropriately. Let me say that again. She has heard the message of Jesus and responded appropriately. You know what makes that so important and so fascinating? And the gospel of Mark, You know, the disciples aren't the first Christians. They're not even the first true disciples. The first disciple, the first, the very first disciple is an unnamed woman. The very first Christian in all of history 
if being a disciple, being a follower of Jesus means that I have heard the message and I have responded appropriately, the very first disciple is a woman who doesn't even get her name in the book. Now, I, I would like to suggest that maybe there's a purpose for that. That, that, that Mark, who's writing, says that she has lost her identity and a new definition of who she is. I mean, who knows what this lady came up behind Jesus with, right? She came up behind Jesus going, I've screwed up. I've, I've, been, I've been divorced. I've screwed up. I did, I did this. I screwed up. I did this. I, I, I ran away from my parents. I screwed up. I did that. And she's got this story, right? We all got a story, right? And here's this woman who comes up behind Jesus and anoints him. And immediately who she is and what she is defined by is changed by the grace of Christ. Her definition of who she is is so transformed that they even remove her name. And she's just from there on out through eternity. Wherever the gospel is preached, she'll be known as the woman madly in love with Jesus. How awesome is that? Now, we got to pause. This is so huge. This is so, so huge. Hey, listen, if we lose who we are, Jesus says, if you take up your cross and follow me, or if we lose who we are, if we, if we say, I'm going to come and I'm going to die to myself. That's the language that's used in Scripture. I'm going to die to myself, take up my cross and follow you. My identity is going to be wrapped up in my Savior. It changes everything about who we are. Listen, our daughters would not date bozo losers if they understood who they were in Jesus Christ. If they sat there and said, I am beautiful and sacred, I don't deserve that. You're an idiot. Get the heck out of here. Right? And wouldn't that be a great day for us as parents? Right? We'd be like, Woo! Jesus, big W! High five down the hall! And our sons, they would treat our daughters different if they understood this message. That they are called to be Jesus Christ dating another fellow partner in Jesus Christ, and they would not say the things they do. They would not act the way they do. They would say, how can I honor you as Jesus honored his bride? I tell you what, our high school would look completely different if our kids grabbed onto this. Yeah. And our marriages, they would look completely different too, wouldn't they? One day, because, because we would start to like really hit that point where you're like, look, I don't know if I can stand you at all. I am on the edge of giving up. And then we would say, yeah, but I'm, my, my identity, my definition, who I am is wrapped up in the cross. And then we would say, because Jesus forgave when I didn't deserve it and he's forgiven so much, I don't ever have the right to say I won't forgive you. And we're going to keep working through this no matter how hard it is. Because every time we think, I just can't do anymore, we're going to look to the cross and go, dang it, my God had nails driven through his hands and legs for me. What sacrifices do I think I can't make for my lover? And when our kids drive us crazy, and we want to get the duct tape, and take them out back and wrap it around them in that tree and pour honey and molasses over them and wait for a week to come back and get them. Now, come on, if you have a two-year-old, you should have said amen right there. Or a 17-year-old, anybody in between, right? Some of you have a husband you were saying that about too. It is in those moments that I turn back to Jesus at the cross and say, here's my identity. Here's what defines me. God, you are so patient with me. I mean, on a daily basis, I look and I go, oh, I didn't get that right again. God, you are so patient with me. I mean, you should have zapped me. And if you're going to be that patient with me, I want to be like you. I want to be defined by you. And so, therefore, I can't tie that child up to the tree, even though I want to. For those of us who have endured a definition that we have lived with for a while that has defined us in the negative. You can throw out whatever one you want. I've been abused. I, 
I cheated here. I, I, I've been, whatever, whatever, whatever negative definition that you've lived with. For some of us, it's just still the, the third grade horror of feeling like I've been called ugly and I'm stupid and I'm no good. And maybe it was even someone that should have loved you, like a parent who, who didn't do that, who didn't give you those words that you need. Just, just let me say, your life does not have to be defined by that. It can be redefined because that life that was defined by that died at the cross. And when you were resurrected, through your baptism, you got a new definition of who you are. Parents, 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 parents. You can't give what you don't have. And if you are carrying around with you a definition that is defined in the negative, you will pass that on to your kids. It is an absolute guarantee. Whether you do it intentionally or unintentionally, they're smart enough to figure out there's a piece of mom that's broken and hurt, and you will hand off that brokenness. But rather, what would it be like to be defined by Christ and say, there's part of me that's broken, but it's becoming whole. It's in the process of becoming. There's a part of me that doesn't want to forgive so and so, but it's in the process of becoming. There's a part of me that believes that I'm always the victim or that I'm always abused or that I'm always defined by this, but, but I'm in the process of becoming something else defined by Christ because I'm on the journey to the cross. Wow. It changes everything. It changes everything. She was from Mark. The Gospel of Mark, the writer of Mark, the first believer. She believed in the words of Jesus and responded appropriately. Real quick, I want to show you where this goes and why this is important. We talk a lot in the church about what do you really believe? And we talk a lot about core beliefs and why they're important. And I've thrown up here on the board uh, eight core beliefs, and we're going to kick them out to you on Twitter and other stuff all week so you don't have to worry about memorizing them or getting them down. But I, I just want to suggest to you that, that, you see, the woman hears the message of Jesus. She hears, believe this, and she believes it and therefore responds appropriately. That if we have eight core beliefs, every action that the church takes is based out of the fact that we have these core beliefs. Now, let me show you what I'm talking about. What, let me show you what I'm talking about. Uh, we believe, uh, number six, that Satan is real. That's one of the core beliefs of a church. We just believe Satan's real. And so, therefore, we believe there is somebody whispering into our ear this negative. There is somebody whispering into our ear, you're no good. You can't do that. You're stupid. You're ugly. You're a slut. You will always be a whatever it is. We believe there is somebody whispering, but we also, therefore, believe that there is the voice of God which is saying, no, 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 don't listen to the lie. Don't listen to the lie. You are beautiful and sacred. I made you that way. And you can get it dirty, but you can't change your DNA. And if you get it dirty, you can be washed clean by the blood of the cross. Another one would be uh, the idea that God is all-powerful and all-knowing, the creator of the universe, number four, who sovereignly rules it today through uh, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we see this a moment of relationship where it's, it's confusing, like God's three in one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they're, they're all one, and yet there's this, some distinction about them. And we, we, we can go on all day trying to figure that out and understand what that means and, and just claim the fact that look, over and over in the Bible it's describing the Trinity. And here's what we do. We go that God is relational. And therefore, we as a church need to learn how to be relational. And so when I come to church and, and, and we have some differences, we go, look, God is relational. We need to be relational. We can't let the stupid things that often divide us, divide us anymore. And that changes, how, again, how we do our marriages. It changes how we raise our kids. It changes how we hang out with our parents. It changes everything because our God is relational and perfect love. Jesus says, do it like me. Be like me. Be defined by me. And suddenly it changes every one of our relationships. You see, Belief in Jesus and what Jesus did changes how we do everything. Changes how we do everything. We don't force others into a religion. We don't force others to believe what we believe. But instead, because of our belief that the Scripture is true, we see there's the cross. Jesus could have got up and sent an entire army out to annihilate everybody. Instead, he said, I'm dying for you to save you. It changes everything. So let's pause a second. Let's wrap it up now. What defines you? 
See, here's what I believe. I believe a handful of us at least walked in going, I was defined by the negative. But now that I've heard this message, I'm starting to go, maybe I don't need to be defined by that anymore. I've spent the last X amount of years going, that was who I am. There's my definition. But what would happen if after the service someone walked up to you and stuck out their hand and said, hi, I'm Aaron, and you said, hi, I'm so-and-so, and and then you started saying, well, what's the next question? Like, well, what do you do, right? Or who are you? And instead of saying, well, I work as a business person for blah, 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 you said, I am madly in love with Jesus. And it defines every part of me. That would be an amazing conversation that you could go into, couldn't it? That would be a lot of fun. And what a moment of healing for some of us to say, I had been defined by, and it's not even here anymore. Wow. So uh, we did this last week, and uh, it doesn't mean we're going to do it every Sunday, but... uh, we thought it was helpful enough that we would pause and do it again and just say, hey, let's do a quick Q&A and uh, have some conversations. And some of you have been sending them in on Twitter. And uh, we're going to do this just real quick and just say, hey, here's, here's some next steps to go with this. So, so uh, we just had, I actually just tweeted out that we were doing this. So uh, John said, how do we begin this journey? So if we live our lives defined by how culture sees us, how society, how, you know, a negative image has defined us, and, and we carry that around with us. How do we begin living this journey towards being defined by Jesus rather than allowing that other thing to define who we are? Yeah, which is, we're really saying, like, hey, what's the first couple steps that I should take here? Uh, so the first step is this, be in church. You see, people underestimate the value of the church family, which, A, you hear the message, and then there are others around you that are struggling with the same thing. And then, you see, the danger is if I, I'm not in church, I can start making up my own religion because there's no accountability. And so I come to church, and I'm held accountable, and then at church, I start to hear the gospel message over and over again, which is about grace and about forgiveness and about love, but it's also about living in holiness. And so the next step after I'm in church is, as I say, to be, I begin to hear the message, surrender to the cross, and I say to Jesus, I don't know how you're going to do this. I don't know what it's going to take. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I don't want to carry this anymore. I'm going to put this bag that I've been hauling around my whole life, I'm going to lay it down right here, and then, and then we, we begin to move on to appropriate steps. For some of us, that means we need to see the counselor that we have here at church. For some of us, that means we just need to, to, to really dive into the scriptures and allow God to pour into us new levels of healing. For some of us, well, for all of us, that means we should find a, a small group of people that can hold us accountable and, and, and know us intimately. And when we say know each other in a naked sense, that here I am, can you still love this if you really knew everything? And to have that small group of people really say, yeah, we still love you by the grace of God. So many, we're getting some good questions. <laughs> uh, so the next one is, uh, how do I change my brokenness? Well, I think we started to answer that one, which is, uh, again, depending on your level of brokenness. You know, if, if my heart feels like it's shattered, you know, I, I'm probably going to need some counseling. Uh, again, one of the beauties is just in the last year, we've added on a counselor here at church who has this from amazing sliding scale. So you're not being charged big bucks. But, uh, you know, for some of us, it means counseling. For some of us, it means we just need to have the courage to share it with a friend. You know, for a lot of us, we feel like if, I, if you knew this, you would treat me different. You wouldn't love me. And so I've never shared this. But the reality of it is we've got to find someone who has the love of Jesus that we go, you have Christ in you, and I've got to be brave enough to share it. And then we have to respond appropriately. Like the church has to go, I love you, I forgive you. And that, that is huge. That is huge. This is the, the last one we've received. How do we help people who hurt too much to believe? Wow. That's a good one. Yeah. You can have that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, this, is, this is a big question because this is one of the reasons why I believe most people don't go to church. I don't believe that there are many people out there who have researched Scripture and life enough and then come and said, hey, God doesn't exist. In fact, I don't think you can do that. I think that if you really crawl into the Bible, I, I think history has taught us over and over again, when you start to crawl into Scripture and other religions, you end up 
becoming a Christian. And it's funny how many, how many people that are my heroes, like Lee Strobel and C.S. Lewis, who, you know, they were atheists who said, you know, I'm going to prove this wrong. And they got into it, and then, well, shoot, this is right. Now they're, you know, huge believers, and they wrote books. And, and, but, but most people don't believe in Jesus, not because they've researched it, but because I've been so hurt. That how would a loving God, loving God that you talk about allow this to happen? And we, we talk about this at least two or three times a quarter. And we do an entire message on this. That, that look, God doesn't cause pain. But he can use it. In fact, the entire sermon series that we're going to do after Easter is about this. That, that, that God can use your hurt. But, but it really is about the church continuing to be patient and love that person through it to look for open doors to speak wisdom into it. You know, it's like, well, why did God allow that person to do that? What, what would you have like God to do? Would you like him to have come down and zap him? Or, you know, you want God to suddenly take away all the free will? And, and, and again, what would you have liked God to do to respond? It doesn't make it an easy conversation at all. Well, and I, I think another piece is, you know, when when we're with friends or loved ones that are in this mode um, or in this uh, part of their life when they're just angry and bitter and, and they just they don't want to believe, um, the best thing that we can do is just to begin that daily prayer for them, um, but also to show them not all Christians are like this. You know, if we can begin to live our lives in a way that models how Jesus would love somebody, even in the midst of, of their anger, um, they, be, they can slowly begin to see that they're not all like that. Right. You know, if we can start showing people grace and love and mercy in the midst of all circumstances, you know, again, that just allows them to see, okay, it's not always like this. I don't always walk into a church and they immediately condemn me for who I am and what I'm doing. You know, but here is a church that is loving people. Here is a group of Christians that have surrounded me in the midst of my mess. You know, again, if we can begin to show people that Jesus does things differently, and because he does things differently, we do things differently, and we live differently. You know, again, that, that slowly trickles, and it's not going to be instantaneous for everybody. Right. I mean, you know, sometimes it's, it takes years um, for that to kind of sink in, but, you know, again, if we live our lives the way that God has called us to live, people see that. And that's why the testimonies are so powerful, and why I keep saying to you, some of you need to share your story, because the Sunday you share will be that Sunday that someone new is in church going, oh my God, that's my story. That, that is, I mean, like you are in my life right now. You are sharing my life story. I didn't think that there was recovery from. But you're telling me right now there's hope. And again, that's why our stories that, that we share on occasion, why we keep inviting you, we need more people to do that. They're just so powerful because they're modern day examples of God overcame even this. Is that good? Any more questions? Chirps. I like chirps. Chirps are sometimes good. I was like, li- I was really nervous. <laughs> that was like live feedback. I was holding on to the table. Hey, let me pray for you, and then we're going to do our offering. God, uh, with the question, I just pray for, I pray for individuals who are hurt so badly that they, they can't see through the hurt to believe in you. And yet, Father, I believe you are a holy, awesome God who can use that hurt to draw people near. That you can use that pain to say, you don't have to live like this anymore. There is a different way to live. There is a different definition. You don't have to be defined as someone who endured this, but you can be defined as someone resurrected into a holy, awesome life because they're beautiful and sacred. God, I pray that we as parents embrace this and we wrap that new, de- new definition around ourselves. I pray that we pass it on to our, our kids, our, our grandkids, our, our teenagers, Father, that they, they hear that along this journey of growing up that they're taking. Lord Jesus, may we surrender everything to you and do what we can, when we can, to respond appropriately to the love you've given to us. In your holy, precious name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Would you stand and receive your blessing?
the people of God who no longer be, need to be defined by the culture they live in or the mistakes of your past or the abuse that you've endured. May you go forth and proclaim good news to others, declaring that there is a Savior who died for you and has been resurrected to give you a new definition of life. You are beautiful and sacred in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.